when I was here in 2004 to 2007, it was just a different group of people. And I'm seeing people who I vaguely can recognize who are young and who are just grown men now, you know, families, uh, big beards, they're just big, big men now. So it's, it's interesting to come back. And you never think life is going to leave you behind, right? Like you're going to look back and reminisce and see other people are older, but it happens to everyone. Um, but it's good to be back um, in the NEC, and I pray that our time spent together will be a blessing. Let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, we ask that for these next few moments, you will still our minds. We pray that you will allow our minds to be fertile ground to receive the seed of your word. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will do its work in each of our life. I pray that the words which I speak will be taken and will apply in a special way beyond human capacity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The stream of Seventh-day Adventism is fed by the teardrops of the Great Disappointment. The stream of Seventh-day Adventism is fed by the teardrops of the Great Disappointment. In October, 20, October 22nd in 1844, a Tuesday, it didn't happen. Jesus didn't return. The clock struck midnight and the Millerites, the pre-Adventists that came out of the Millerite movement were wrong. George Knight, one of the church's scholars on church history from Andrews University comments, he says the mathematical certainty of the faith of the pre-Adventists, the Millerites, were dashed. They had quit their jobs, left their homes, left crops unharvested, and sold all of their stuff. So you can imagine the Millerite Adventists, the pre-Adventists, looking up into the sky, expecting to see uh, a cloud the, the size of a man's fist coming from the east. But it never came. There were no trumpets, there was no blaring, no angel singing, no lights, no iridescence, and the Advent movement came to a screeching halt. Many people who'd given up their livelihoods, many people who told their friends that Jesus is coming were essentially left with egg on face. The ones who remained splintered into various groups over the significance of that Tuesday in 1844. Some claimed that the date was bogus. Others said Christ had actually returned, but he'd returned spiritually. And finally, a group, the future leaders of the early Adventist church, were convinced that the date was right, but the event was wrong. And from there, you have the green shoots of the Seventh-day Adventist movement that was born in failure rather than in success, in error rather than in truth. But, but we learn an important lesson from the disappointment that burst what we know to be the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You see, disappointments have a way of clarifying the stream of our life. Like disappointments purge the things that start to clog up things in our life and allow us to see them properly. So uh, right now I live in Seattle, in Washington, um, and if your geography was like mine before I went to America, you have no idea where that is. And if you hear Washington, you think DC, you're thinking East Coast. Seattle is not even there. It's close to Vancouver, which you don't even know where that is either. <laughs> That's in Canada. So just think, <laughs> New York is here, California is here. We all know California and New York. So if you go up the West Coast uh, to, you go to California, then Oregon, then Washington, and we are essentially right in the corner of the country, right? So in Seattle, um, I have been pulled into what is called the 12th man mania. 
And this is the equivalent of England's Barmy Army. Who knows what the Barmy Army is? I'm, I know Adam knows. I don't know if anyone else knows. So the Barmy Army is, is the name which is given both to the English football team, but it actually originates from the cricket supporters, the Barmy Army. So in Seattle, they have the 12th man. And these are the rabid, frothing at the mouth, uh, crazy supporters of the Seattle Seahawks. And if you know who the Seahawks are, let me see, you know who the Seahawks are, a few of you. So they are the American football team that is based in Seattle. Last year, they got to their second consecutive Super Bowl final. And uh, the passage there was almost miraculous. You know, you can check out for uh, two minutes if you hate football, if you don't care about sports. But essentially, they are in the... Um, NEC, is it, was it the NEC? No, the NFC conference playoffs. They play the uh, Green Bay Packers. It looks like they're about to lose. And coming to the end of the game, uh, Russell Wilson, the quarterback, throws a pass. And Jermaine Curse um, makes this miraculous pass. He goes into overtime. We get the first, um, we win the toss of the coin. They get the ball and we go on to win. Improbable, we should never have got to the Super Bowl. So we get to the Super Bowl, and we play the New England Patriots with a guy named Tom Brady. And Tom Brady has the reputation in America, and he's as, as beloved in America as, um, I don't know, Diego Costa is in England, right? No love, no love. If you're a Chelsea supporter, I don't care, no love. No one likes Diego Costa, no one likes Tom Brady. So the uh, Seahawks are playing the Patriots, and we're not doing well. We get to the last two minutes of the game. I'm watching the game with some people, and uh, you think, you know, it's fine. We, we won the Super Bowl last year. It's fine if we don't win this year. And then again, there's an improbable play. Russell Wilson gets the ball, throws it to Jermaine Curse, the wide receiver. He catches it. Yeah, that would be great if that was on purpose, right? <laughs> Boom. So Jermaine Curse catches the ball, and as he's falling backwards, it seems as if the ball has come out of his hands, and then he manages, manages to snag it, and he's about five yards from the touch, from the end zone. So, Everyone is thinking, it's a miracle. God loves Seattle more than New England. Like, literally in the courts of heaven, they have made an executive decision for Seattle. And we are just waiting for the ball to be given to Marshawn Lynch, and he's, the, he's a black guy with dreads whose nickname is Beast Mode. And we're assuming, you know, you have four chances to move the ball five yards, we will win. But for some reason, that we never understand, Russell Wilson, instead of passing the ball, throws it five yards and is picked off, someone intercepts it, and we lose the game. And it, I mean, you already feel it. Yeah, I, I saw some go, ah, right. So imagine now that you are in Seattle. It was like a dagger to the heart. And there were uh, apocryphal stories told of husbands coming home, and then their wives would be like, you know, where's Tony? Haven't seen Tony since he, he came home because Tony's so crushed, he couldn't sleep. He went for a three-hour walk in the dark. And no, these are true stories. I had a friend who was babysitting who the, the husband just disappeared. Another one came, his, his kids tried to talk to him. He couldn't even talk to his kids. And I realized that as much as I don't really watch American football, I still follow the Premier League even though I'm in Seattle, that night I couldn't sleep. Weird. It doesn't matter how stressed I am in my life, I can normally sleep. That night, I couldn't sleep. And the night after, I would wake up thinking about Russell Wilson throwing a pick. And it was absolutely horrendous. <laughs> what does that mean when disappointments happen and we react in that way? What does it reveal about us? Guys, when she breaks up with you, and this is guys, right, not girls. When she breaks up with you and you start bawling your eyes out and you start listening to your uh, special uh, song list on Spotify to get you through the day, it says something. <laughs> the intensity of our disappointment reveals 
The intensity of your disappointment reveals the, the, the depth of uh, feeling and love you had for her. Even if you told all your friends you weren't whipped, you, you were whipped. <laughs> when, amen, right? <laughs> Someone's saying that. Don't, don't. <laughs> all right, I don't know who your friend is, but now we all know his business. When, when a son looks at his father in the stands at a football game because uh, he failed to show up, his disappointment speaks. When a daughter is at a piano recital and mom isn't able to make it for the third time and she is crushed, the look of disappointment speaks. When things don't disappoint us, we know we don't care about them. And when things disappoint us a little bit, we know that we care a little. But when we feel a great disappointment, we know that whatever caused it matters an awful lot. And so here you have a scattered group of people who are crushed because on that Tuesday in 1844, the hope of their entire world, they had put all their eggs in one basket, it didn't happen. And as I reflect on this group of people and I think about myself and I think about us as we try to form our identity, as we figure out what does it mean to be a Seventh-day Adventist, I am drawn there to the very start of our church. If you read history just in a really cursory way and you look at other Christian denominations and you say, how did they start? You know, how, how did other Christian denominations start? If you look at the Church of England, for example, in 1534, Henry, after uh, doing his uh, thing with his wives, you know, what was it? Uh, died, divorced, no, nope. Be- divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Yeah, there you go, GCSE history, right? <laughs> so when, when you look at him, he goes on to declare himself the, essentially the personal pope and pontiff of England so he can get a divorce and marry the woman he wants. So the Church of England comes out of his personal and political whims. When you look at the uh, Reformation from the Roman Catholic Church, you find Martin Luther starting a reform movement based on sola scriptura and on faith, uh, salvation through faith alone. And so you have a church that comes out and eventually becomes the Lutheran Church. Methodists are launched because of the zeal of Charles and John Wesley. And some movements begin in opposition to or in support of some doctrine in scripture. Some come out of conflict because a group of people hate each other. And some come out of a desire to be different and practice religion in the way they choose. Adventism wasn't born as a reform movement, though it adopted various reforms. Adventism was not a reform movement. Adventism wasn't born as a temperance movement, although we have helpful things to say about how to live the best life God has for you. And we have stats, seven years, ten years, blue zones, but the church was not born as a temperance movement. Adventism wasn't even born as a theological movement in the sense that we were trying to correct an error within a denomination that we were already part of. You know, the Adventist church was a mishmash of Methodist, Christian Connection, Baptist, and a whole conglomerate of different denominations that came together, but it wasn't because we were trying to correct theological error within a denomination. Adventism wasn't born because of special revelation to a prophet, although one did emerge as a guide to clarify and to back the Bible. Adventism, I submit this morning, was birthed from a conviction that scripture held the answer to the greatest questions in life. So this is repeat and uh, this is repetition deepens the impression from what Pastor Kim was saying yesterday. I believe that Adventism was birthed from a conviction that scripture held the answer to the greatest questions of life. And the great question that was spurring Adventists at that time 
in the, in the historical milieu of the Great Awakening happening in America was the question, where is Jesus and when is he coming back? That was the question of the day. And if we can distill some of these grand questions in life, we can do it in three words, significance, destiny, and purpose. And following the bitter disappointment of that day, uh, Adventist history tells us that there were a group of men who were walking through a cornfield. We have uh, one man, Hiram Edson. He's with another man. There's B, uh, F. B. Hahn and there's E. L. Crozier, and they're walking through a cornfield. And as they walk through the uh, cornfield, Hiram Edson has a vision. And he writes about that vision, and it's a vision of the heavenly sanctuary. In his vision, he saw Christ was not coming out of the most holy place to the earth at the end of the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel 8, but Hiram Edson sees a vision where Christ moves from the uh, first apartment in the heavenly sanctuary excuse me, yeah, the, f the first to the second. So he moves from the holy to the most holy to perform an important work. So Hiram Edson, O.R. Crozier, F.B. Hahn, go back to the Bible, and they pour themselves into the Bible, and they look again at Daniel chapter 8, they look at Hebrew 8, they look at Hebrew 9, and they see that this ministration of Christ, which is a type, it's a shadow uh, of what the, the earthly sanctuary prefigured, points to Christ moving to uh, the, the, the most holy place to do an important work. And so it's back at this, uh, the study of the scripture that the Seventh-day Adventist church finds its root. It's founded in scripture, it's rooted in scripture, and it's scripture that has buoyed the church through the rough storms or, uh, in the 150 years that the church has existed. A contemporary of these early Adventists was Joseph Smith, the uh, founder of the Mormon church, the LDS. He also had a vision in a grove in New York and Joseph Smith believed he saw a clear vision of Christ and was given correct doctrines about Jesus Christ that no one else had. Joseph Smith went on and had his vision canonized. He was put in a book that Mormons see as essentially being holy. And that book is called The Pearl of Great Price. Okay, so you have two 19th century visions of people who came out of uh, movements of trying to understand the times. So Edson has one, they go back to scripture. Joseph Smith has one, they canonize it, and it becomes one of the main tenets of the Mormon church, the pearl of great price. It's at this point that the Assembly Adventists and the Mormon church and most other churches depart because Seventh-day Adventism sprouted from a deep grounding in the rich soil of scripture. This ragtag group of disappointed, disappointed believers went back to the Bible and began to study to see where they had gone wrong. They went back to Scripture because they wanted to know where Jesus was and what he was doing. And today, most churches don't even know what Jesus is doing. And this is probably coming to, I guess, the core of of what I see as being a, a, a demarcation for being a Seventh-day Adventist, when we look at both scripture and we look at what Christ is doing right now in the sanctuary. Most churches essentially go to Matthew, and they go and, oh, excuse me, they go to, uh, what, you'll correct me, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They go to the scripture and they say, you know what Christ is doing right now? I know exactly what he's doing. Christ is building mansions. That's exactly what he's doing. There is the biggest cosmic heavenly building site ever going on. And Christ is like the chief foreman building mansions for all of us. You don't, leave, you don't need to live in a council house when you get to heaven because Christ is building a mansion for you. Most 
people have no idea. And if you look at this understanding of what Christ is doing right now, it's an it's a understanding which belittles the strength of the gospel and the strength of why you should even be a Christian, let alone a Seventh-day Adventist. Are you kidding me? Christ is building houses with angels supervising him while there are kids being molested, while there are people who are crying out to God because they don't have clean water to drink, where there are people who, who are living lives of total misery and Christ does not come to intercede, Christ does not come back to bring an end to this because he is a foreman on a cosmic building site making mansions. That's what he's doing. Do you, do you see how ridiculous that notion is? And do you understand a little bit, even before you get into the details or the nitty gritty of it, of why the, why the sanctuary message and the understanding of what Christ is doing now is an important foundational tenet of what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Christ in heaven, while ISIS wrecks the life of people from Paris to Belgium to Syria, he's installing double glazing while the world goes to hell. Philippiansi in his 2002 book, The Jesus I Never Knew, says the biggest question he struggles with is where is Jesus and what is he doing? What is he waiting for? More people to die and to suffer. Yancey doesn't know and the majority of Christians don't even consider the issue. And here we go back to Hiram Edson, Crozier and F.B. Hahn, who studied the Bible and were led to a skeletal understanding of the scripture. Now, for Sunday Adventists, this understanding of the scripture is um, enumerated in fundamental belief number 23. And as far as I know, it's the only doctrine which is held unique to Sunday Adventists. All, our, all of our other doctrines for the most part, are shared with other denominations. Even the great controversy, you have people like Greg Boyd who have this uh, motif of Christus Victor, of Christ having to vindicate himself. But the sanctuary is the only one, the only uh, doctrine, the only teaching that we have that is absolutely unique to the Seventh-day Adventist church. The sanctuary doctrine gives us hope that the original cosmic order that God established will be restored. The sanctuary message tells us that through judgment, vindication, and cleansing, God will restore the original order of things. Through scripture, the doctrine of the sanctuary, we understand that the consummation of God cleansing his people and of the universe being cleansed will uh, will result in a final judgment that will bring harmony to the universe. Through the sanctuary message, we understand that, uh, like Pastor Kim was saying yesterday, it's almost less about us and more about God, because all have already sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there is no need for there to be an investigative judgment looking at what we cannot already do, which is to achieve our own righteousness. But it's to see if God is justified in how he has acted thus far. And so this actually, for me, living in Seattle and speaking to people in Seattle, uh, which is very similar to England, you know, people, when, when I'm pastoring there, people um, ask me what I think about the fact, I think in Seattle, the um, percentage of Christians or nuns just continues to increase. It's one of the most secular cities in America, which is hilarious because in England, I was just reading an article in The Guardian, right now in England you have a balance of 50% to 49.6% of people who say they are Christians, 50% of Christians, 
49.6% in England essentially say they are not Christians. So they could be Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs, agnostics, atheists. So this country is already at a tipping point. I mean, if, if that were to happen in America, they would literally think the sky was falling in. So even Seattle isn't that bad. But when you talk about what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, what it means to be a Christian, one of the things that people are constantly trying to figure out is where is the intersection between what we believe, we can do all the maths tables, but who cares? How does this make a difference to my life right now? How do I speak about what I believe? How do I take Daniel 8, 14, the 2300-day prophecy, the investigative judgment, which we see started from the ascension of Christ through to 1844, how do I talk about that to someone? What avenue do I have to show them that being a Seventh-day Adventist speaks to the life in which they live? And when we come to the sanctuary, one thing which I have found is that it gives us an insight into the justice of God. In Psalm 73, yeah, let's go there. Psalm 73. Let's start in. Verse 12, the Bible says, Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. So here we have the, the writer Asaph asking a question and it's an age-old question, and it's a question people have asked and have come, to the, um, have come to the conclusion that God must be dead. This is a cry asking, why are things as they are now? Where is the justice? And he says, he has seen the ungodly at ease and increasing in riches. He is seeing that it pays not to do good, not to be in church, it pays to do your own thing, to carve your own path, and to run with the crowd. And then verse 15, he says, If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. Then verse 16, When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. And so you find here that there is a sense in which, and I have found this, the doctrine of the sanctuary beyond the investigative judgment, beyond the numbers and the calculations, allows Seventh-day Adventists to speak with a clear, unresounding voice about the God in whom we serve and about the just nature of this God about a God who would not allow innocence to be abused, who would not allow warmongers to press buttons and destroy families, who would not allow CEOs who are pilfering and escaping judgment, who would not allow crooked judges who take bribes and destroy people's innocence to go without making account for what they have done. The sanctuary is so broad, it allows us to speak to people who have this, uh, this itch to want to see the world, to want to see the world as it ought to be. But the sanctuary gives us a vehicle and a hope in which we can see that happen. Because without God, without the sanctuary, Without Christ, without knowing what he is doing now, it's all a pipe dream. It's pie in the sky. It's just a utopia that you're saying, well, we're so good, we can work it out. But when we come to the sanctuary, we see that there is an end of these things. No more Paris, Molenbeek, Iraq, ISIS, Boko Haram, Zika virus, death, abuse, none of those things. Because right now, Christ is working and is vindicating and is judging 
because he cares and because he loves. Adventist eschatology, this is our theology of the end times, has always anticipated a vision where God will come near in a personal way, making visible his permanent presence. And the Adventist doctrine of the sanctuary joyfully anticipates this truth. The Adventist doctrine of the sanctuary lets us know that Christ is still near. Christ has not forgotten. Christ is not just putting in skylights and double glazing window while the world burns. It lets us know that scripture has clearly enumerated a hope that we have to give to a world that for the most part has no hope. It gives us a way to talk about what we believe and what we stand for. And tomorrow I will be uh, looking at Christ in the sanctuary as we look at the object of this truth that established and founded the roots of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this morning we are grateful that you are not twiddling your thumbs, you are not banging nails into wall. We are grateful that you continue to see what is happening in this world. We are grateful, God, that you reveal yourself to us when we are unsure and when we are confused. I pray that this morning we will be uh, revived and we will be given hope again that through your ministry in the sanctuary, not only are you vindicating and pleading our case, but you are making a way in which justice can be executed in this world. You give us something good to tell to the world. You give us a gospel which will give hope and which will brighten the dark skies in which we live. Help us to take the time to understand these things and to reconnect with the beautiful work that you are doing on our behalf right now is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.